and intestines explode from my anus. Back to something more familiar. Can you beat Morrowind with only poison damage? Yes, but how? Pretty simple on the surface. Any damage we deal must be poison based. That means no fire, frost, shock, magic, or physical damage is allowed. And just to cover all my bases, no conjuring familiars to fight for me. Won't be in the spirit of things. What about Sunder and Keening? Well, I have a plan for that. There are no other rules for this run beyond the typical stuff. No bugs or glitches, no fortify loops with alchemy, no pause screen buff cheese, oh, and max difficulty so the fights are a bit more dangerous. And that's it. Poison damage only. We'll do some silly stuff with NPCs along the way too, specifically with the Mudcrab Merchant. We're gonna have to be a mage for this run. Even though we can craft poisons via alchemy, Marwind never implemented weapon poisons like you see on Oblivion and Skyrim. Pure poison damage comes from the Destruction School, and it's the worst of the damage types. The base cost of poison spells is 9, compared to Fire and Frost's 5 and Shock's 7. Meanwhile, a lot of enemies resist or are outright immune to poison, and enemies can easily eliminate your poison effects with a Cure Poison Potion. That's all it takes. The only benefit of poison magic is that Argonians are immune to it and you don't actually have to fight any of them, but you can be one. This means if any of your poison spells are reflected, you won't be damaged. This completely eliminates my major concern with playing a mage in Morrowind. As for skills, the most important is destruction as a major. The rest of the magic schools will have some use, but most of what I'll be using them for can be replaced with simple enchanted items. Unsurprisingly, we're taking acrobatics and athletics as major skills because movement speed is paramount. Although I did discover a rather absurd way of traversing the world with a minimal setup. We'll get into that. It's pretty cool. A lot of you probably already know about it, but if you don't, stay tuned. Since we'll be needing a good deal of Magicka for this run, I'm going with the Atronach sign. I'm not restricting myself from using creature merchants, so gold won't be that much of a roadblock. We'll be able to buy dozens of exclusive Magicka potions from Nalkaria on a whim. I'm also a Lady Argonian for this run. They start with less agility and speed than male Argonians, but with more willpower and intelligence. The bigger our Magicka pool, the better. It's also why I didn't pick Alchemy as a major or minor skill. We can use it to maximize our intelligence gains every time we level up without having to worry about alchemy actually leveling us up. But that doesn't mean we won't be grabbing intelligence boosting gear along the way. Are you kidding me? That's the third time today. Having trouble there? I am narratively spurious clung. I was trying to edit, and you know how resource hungry editing software can be, and my current internet browser inhales RAM like crazy. Couldn't you just close your current internet browser? And work without background noise? I don't think so. So use Opera GX. It's free and it supports the channel if you download it using the link operagx.gg slash jbn. Why do you... Never mind. W why am I downloading this? Well, Opera GX lets you manage the resources it uses, like RAM and CPU usage, right there in the sidebar. And there's a bunch of customization options too. You could even install pre-made mods and mix and match them however you want. I like using the Oblivion mod for the visuals, and the Morrowind mod for the background music. But check out the keyboard sounds. And there's a bunch of features available to put in the sidebar as well, like Discord or YouTube Music. Generative AI too. Go ahead, ask ChatGPT something. What happened to Indoril Nerevar? Wow, quite thorough. Sure is. Thanks, narratively spurious clone. You've helped me once again. Oh, I'm not the clone. Do you really think if I had a clone, I wouldn't have the clone doing the editing? Try Opera GX for free today. Support the channel by downloading Opera GX at operagx.gg slash jbn or click the link in the description box below. As we leave Sedanine, on foot this time around, we pick up three of the four mushrooms Ajira's gonna ask us for. Yeah, we'll be doing the Mage's Guild quests during this run. Hypofascia, Bungler's Bane, and Luminous Ursula all growing around this tree. Violet Copernus is somewhere around here too. Oh, free hat. Usually I loot the mushrooms on the way to the Silch Strider, but instead of going straight to Balmora on the back of our neurologically manipulated pals, we're heading west of St. Anine, I said east in a different video because I'm dumb, to get a ring from the Samaras Ancestral Tomb. And look, there's even a Violet Copernus for us to pick up on the way. 
Did you know, copperness means of dung. Real life copperness mushrooms look like desiccated little poops. We can't kill the undead enemies in these tombs just yet. Even if we had a poison spell, they'd be totally immune without a bit of finessing. But that doesn't mean we can't still grave rob. The urn at the end of the tomb contains the mentor's ring, which fortifies our intelligence and willpower by 10 points each. That's 30 more magicka, and the extra willpower makes our spellcasting chances a bit better. I nearly forgot to tell you what I named the character. Gila. There used to be a tradition of sorts on this channel where I'd go off on a tangent about some interesting animal fact, and I haven't really done that much lately. So, Gila monsters. I've actually talked about this before. They're the only venomous lizard in North America, and allegedly have one of the most painful venoms among all vertebrates. I would think a diamondback's venom would be a bit more painful, since it can kill you. But maybe they... whoever they is, the people who decide what's painful, mean it's the most painful among non-lethal venoms. Look at these chubby little guys. They look like big doofy leopard geckos. I love them. Our Gila is lethal, however. Bigger lizard, more potent poison. Maybe Komodo would have been a better name, but that felt too easy. Also, I think Komodo venom isn't what makes their bites deadly, it's the bacteria. The venom just prevents your blood from clotting, leaving the wound open. Anyway, enough talk about animals. If you leave me to it, I could talk about them all day. After joining the Mages Guild, we start off their quests by giving Ajira some shrooms. I won't go into a huge amount of detail on all these quests. If you're curious about the plot, check out my Archmage with only mysticism video. Ajira's next quest lures Galbadir away from her desk, and that will allow us to steal all of her soul gems, which will come very in handy late. Very. Which will come very much in. Ha come in very handy? Yeah, that works. They'll come in very handy later. Esther Dalen sells a poison spell, and with it we'll be able to create a whole variety of poison spells. On target, on touch, slow burn, quick bursts. And the first spell I make is a 1 to 5 point on touch spell that lasts for 10 seconds. A total of 10 to 50 damage at the cost of only 15 magicka. To make more spells, however, we're gonna need more gold. So I'll sell some stuff to Galbadir as she leaves her post upstairs, and then ransack her desk while placing the fake soul gem like Ajira asked. We pop over to Caldera, steal the orcish armor in the crate in Gorak Manor, and sell it to Creeper along with some of the lower value soul gems, all while doing the Creeper shuffle to ensure maximum profits. Yes, there's the Mudcrab Merchant, and we'll get to him soon enough, but I don't think he buys as much random junk as Creeper anyway. He's mostly weapons and armor, so this is fine for now. And before we leave Caldera, we're gonna buy the Amulet of Recall from Varric Germain, because even though we're a mage, it's still easier to rely on enchanted items for utility spells rather than failing to cast them over and over again. With a nice stack of gold in my pocket, I can start making some purchases around Balmora. The Temple Basement Wizards, I know they're priests, but I prefer Basement Wizard, sell Omsivi um, Intervention, Mark, and Recall. I didn't need to buy Recall, but whatever. And I'm also going to buy some Stone Flower Petals from Lathinu Hlalu before leaving. Ajira wants them. The last time I tried finding my own stone flowers, I was wandering around Pelagiad for ages and never found any. Back in the Mage's Guild, I buy the Feather Spell from Esther Dalen and Dire Weakness to Poison from Moraine Dren. This weakness spell is what makes this run possible. We'll encounter several undead enemies during our quest to topple Dagoth Ur, some of which we have to kill, such as the Wraith of Sul Senapul to get the Urshalaku Bonebiter Bow of Sul Senapul for Sulmatul, the Ashkan of the Urshalaku Ashlander camp. I love writing scripts in a way that grabbing part of it out of context just sounds like gibbering nonsense. The only way to get around an NPC's elemental resistance is with weakness spells. By pairing it with a poison damage effect, we can keep the weakness duration at one second. The spell applies the weakness, then immediately applies the damage. Even if the damage is over a longer duration, it'll still affect the enemy because the damage was applied when there wasn't any resistance, or a reduced resistance. This is how we'll kill ghosts and skeletons, and Argonians should have come up. A 100% magnitude nullifies their resistance completely. You can use a lower magnitude spell, but then you'll be doing significantly reduced damage. A 50% weakness will drop their resistance to 50% from 100%, so you'll only be doing half damage. With a bunch of the spell stuff sorted, for now, we'll get more later. We can get back to helping out the Mages Guild. We'll do as much of the Mages Guild stuff before we pop over to Balmora's Skuma Den. There's really not much of any combat during these quests, so there's no sense rehashing stuff that's not really relevant to the challenge. To finish with the Jira, we buy the last flower we need from Paragon and Fort Moonmoth, bring her a ceramic bowl which we can get from the table besides Rannis, Make it quick, Outlander. and we find her stolen reports here and here. This is the last of the duties she has for us right now, and she won't have any more available until we reach the rank of Warlock. But she does point us to Rannis Athras, who not only promotes us to the rank of Evoker, but gives us two tasks. Collect Monway's guild dues in Punabi and convince Lorar Baraloth in Sulapund to join the guild. Both Punabi and Sulapund are along the same road leading away from the Dunmer stronghold Mirandus. The easiest way to get there is just by walking or levitating, but the more interesting way of getting there is by teleporting there. 
With Miranda's Propylon Index, we can teleport instantly from Hormarin, the Dunmer stronghold west of Balmora. Hormarin is easier to get to than Miranda's, so... Once I'm in Vivek, I buy a bunch of Rising Force potions from Danzo and Dulles and use one of the potions to get a 100 point levitation buff from the shrine just beneath Bardow. This just makes getting around Vivek easier. At the top of the St. Holmes Canton, in the temple, are a bunch of locked doors. Regrettably, I forgot to buy an open spell, but I do have a journeyman lockpick on me. And the doors are only level 5, so they don't take that much effort to open. And behind this door is our first real challenge. A couple rats. We'll grab the index first, though. The poison is slow acting, but because I'm levitating, all I need to do is float around and wait. As satisfying as it may be, I won't always be able to rely on levitation to keep me safe, mostly because it's boring and it's really frustrating to fight when you're levitating. And there will come a point where the slow acting poison is too slow. We'll be experimenting with different types of poisons. Well, the same poison, but let's role play and pretend each spell is a different kind of poison. This one is a paralytic poison. The toxins themselves don't kill, but they cause muscle paralysis, including the muscles controlling the diaphragm, so the victim dies slowly of asphyxiation like the blue ringed octopus's venom. Beautiful animal, super small, very cute, incredibly deadly, don't touch them. And the scariest part is, it's possible not even to feel their bite. You could pick one up, it bites you, and you walk away thinking you're fine, then all of a sudden, you can't breathe and you die. Since I'm passing through Vivek's Mage's Guild, I'll buy a few spells from Sir Alonri. On Ducey's Open Door, of course. Slowfall and Tinner's Hop Toad. We'll have some fun with those a little later. Also, we'll steal the Chimar Vermidium while we're here. A little suspicious that I walked into her closet with a locked chest seconds after buying a spell that can easily open said chest, but no one ever said you had to be smart to be a mage. You just need intelligence. It's different. And you know what? Before going to Panabi and Sulapun, let's do Edwina's duties and get the Amulets of Divine and Omsivian Intervention. For convenience. Buy Chronicles of Nishula from Dorisa Darvel, bring it to Edwina, get a potion from Skinkin Tree's Shade, bring her the copy of the Chimar Vermidium I already stole, check what's going on in Huleen's hut, get jobbed by the scamp, gonna be one of those runs. Poison him and hover until he dies. Naked man is safe, he's probably hungry, so I'll leave the scamp corpse behind. I doubt he'd want to see me unhinge my Argonian jaw and devour it all in one potentially pornographic gulp. The internet's an interesting place. I hate it here. Finally, we return Sir Alonwi's book, and Edwina gives us our amulets. She also advances us to the rank of Conjurer for a small fee of 200 gold. But we can't reach the Magician rank yet because our levels aren't high enough. We need one skill at 50 first. Now, regarding getting around, we all know about the Scrolls of Akarian Flight. 1,000 points of acrobatics for 7 seconds, and with slow fall, you won't tariel yourself. But those scrolls are limited, and far stronger than anything you can cast yourself. Unless you could do some weird stuff with soul trap glitches and alchemy, and it's not relevant to this run. But there is a jump spell. If we make a 100 point jump spell for 1 second, and a 1 point slow fall spell for just a few seconds, we can cast the jump spell, jump immediately, and then cast slow fall during the descent. Timing is the main issue. We could combine both the jump and slow fall spells so we don't have to worry about failing the slow fall cast while we're in the air. The problem is that slow fall makes your jumps weaker. Once you reach the zenith of your leap, your trajectory sort of changes if you have the slow fall buff active. It's not awful, but it's not ideal. Let's carry on with Rannis' duties while I sort out how we're going to handle this. Hormarin to Mirandus, and you can actually see Sulapun from the top of Mirandus, right there, the Velothi Tower. But Punabi is first on the path. We can just bribe Manwe for her guild dues, a few dozen gold for 2,000, which we'll split with Rannis because she's, well, okay, you see, Rannis' parents were killed by Telvani wizards, so she devoted her life to learning the magical arts in order to exact revenge on the mages that wronged her. Everyone loves a good revenge plot, but I think the power she accumulated corrupted her. Everything she has us do is ethically questionable, at best. She probably would want us to kill LeVar Baraloth, but eh, I don't want to do her dirty work all the time. So we're just going to bribe him and he joins the guild. He wouldn't actually talk to me at first because Telvani wizards hate Argonians and my personality is really low. But as luck would have it, he happened to have a fortified personality potion in one of his chests. Enough to lubricate my bribes into his pocket. Who needs personality when you have money and drugs? Unsanctioned training across the river. Yeah, only he stands there. I'll do you a solid and I'll lie for you. Rannis ain't paying me enough to kill you anyway. What am I, the Morak Tong? If she wants an assassin, she better hire an assassin. Instead of escorting a Terramel, I'm just gonna kill him and take his stuff. Okay, I can't do the slow burn with this guy. I did make a super poison spell, 1 to 50 points of poison for 1 second. Low cast chance, high magic cost, but it's perfect for a situation like this where he won't attack me until I attack him a few times. 
Now she wants me to kill an alleged necromancer in Margon. Tashpi, just go back to the mainland. I'll tell Rannis you're dead. I realize that I only have a problem with killing if Rannis tells me to do it. The Telvanni spy she wants us to uncover came into the guild with credentials signed by Chancellor Akato himself, the Imperial Battle Mage. But somehow the Telvanni misspelled the guy's name. Are the Telvanni so stupid that they don't know Akato's actual name? Or are they so arrogant that they assume the guild won't notice? Well, I guess they were right. Edwina has more duties for us. These ones involve collecting Dwemer memorabilia. First, she wants a Dwemer tube. Instead of going to Arkingpunch Sturdums, we can steal a tube from Razid's chest in Fatleg's drop-off. I learned about this during my Thieves' Guild playthrough. Unlocking the chest without Razid noticing is kinda awkward, but you can turn Trasteve toward the wall and he won't see, and if you kinda stand above everything and block Razid's view from you with the pot that's hanging from the wall, it works out. By the way, I've been casting a weak poison spell on myself every so often to train destruction. I resist the damage, and I get some XP. And now that I'm able to get a character level, I want to get about 10 alchemy levels so I can allocate 5 intelligence attribute points when I do level up. It's not pyramid maxing since I don't really care about the other attributes. I just want to get as much magic as possible. Leveling alchemy is easy since you can just buy a bunch of salt rice and marshmallow from Celian Plebo in Wolverine Hall. I'm not going to use the potions though. In fact, I'm not even going to sell them back to them for absurd profits. I'm just going to drop them. All I need is levels. We'll join the Fighters Guild so we could sleep in one of their beds that's just sitting here in the lobby with no privacy. Die. First Brotherhood attack. Let's see how poison works against assassins. <laughs> Evidently not as well as daggers work on my face. Strength, intelligence, and willpower. More carry weight, more magicka, more determination. And spellcast chance. This is what I'll do between levels to guarantee the maximum amount of magicka every level. Admittedly, I could just buy alchemy training, and it'd probably be the same, but whatever. It doesn't matter. I just like to play without paying trainers. Otherwise, I'd min-max all the time. Carrying on, I bought Poisonous Touch from Esther Dalen. 15 to 40 points of poison damage on touch. It's cheaper than the slow burn spell I made. It averages 27.5 points of damage per cast instead of 30, but all that damage occurs in a single second, not over the course of 10. Technically weaker, arguably better. Much like melee has hit chance, magic has cast chance. And the biggest effect is your level in the skill governing the thing you're trying to do. That's kind of obvious, but it segues into what we're doing next. There's a whole slew of items in the game with sanguine suffixes. They're part of a side quest for the leader of the Morag Tong, but all of them grant small constant effects to every single skill. There are 27 skills, there are 27 sanguine items, each one for every skill. The Ring of Sanguine Red Wisdom fortifies our destruction by 5 points, and you can loot it off the corpse of Landrale Verum in Ald Sotha, the Daedric Ruin just outside Vivek. She's a pretty high level, level 25, and there are a bunch of enemies in the ruins with a wide aggro range, so getting to her won't be easy. We got enemies with Ebony equipment, Daedric equipment, we got Dramora, and they all kill me in one hit. The worst part is, I used the levitation shrine to get here quickly, so now I'm dealing with that added layer of obnoxiousness while fighting. If you levitate just a bit too high, enemies start running around frightened like they're being attacked by a ghost. I'm just a floating lizard with poison for claws. Chill out. Ironically, the mage I was after was the easiest to kill. She drops three different rings. One that fortifies destruction, one that fortifies enchant, and one that fortifies conjuration all by five points. And there's a grand soul gem here with an ogrim soul. Not bad. It summons a Dramora when we take it though, but we could just leave. Let's do some of the NPC silliness I mentioned. I have a lot of expensive gear I want to sell. The ebony sword, the ebony shield, the several Daedric Tontos I got from that dungeon. But I don't want to sell them to Creeper. He only has 5,000 gold and I'd have to do a lot of Creeper shuffling if I want to sell all this stuff. But I also don't want to have to trek out to the Mud Crab Merchant every time I want to sell something. And I don't want to place my mark near him because that feels like a waste of a mark. So... Let's bring the Mud Crab Merchant to a city. We buy Command Creature and Command Humanoid from Felon Marion and craft two spells. Command Creature, one level for 10 seconds, and Command Humanoid, 10 levels for 2 seconds. And we're going to get a 100-point Frenzy Humanoid spell from Eleni Halaren in Sajith Mora. But well, the Mud Crab Merchant is a creature. Why Command Humanoid? Why Frenzy Humanoid? Ah, we won't be escorting the Merchant. Oh no, I have a more esoteric plan in mind. The Caldera Guild Guide, Emilia Doronia, is only level 6, so our command spell will work on her. Command and NPCs will follow you through doors, that much is obvious, but they also follow you if you take a boat, hop on a silt strider, or use a guild guide, including the guild guide themselves. With Amelia commanded, we can have her teleport us to, 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 to With Amelia commanded, we can have her teleport us to Vivek together. By casting Frenzy on her, she'll continue chasing us until we cast command on her again. So we can have her chase us to the door, command her, go through the door, and frenzy her again. Now all that's left to do is lead her to the Mudcrab Merchant without getting hit by her. She's only level 6, but I'm basically made out of paper.
Now that we're here, we cast Command Creature on the Merchant, and Command Humanoid on Amelia, so now they're both our companions, and we can pay her to teleport all three of us to Balmora. And look at that, we got a Creature Merchant right in the most iconic city in Morrowind. Ain't that convenient. Time to make some deals. After selling him all the useless weapons I looted from Alt Sotha, I'm now sitting at over 100,000 gold. What more is there to do with gold in Morrowind than use stolen soul gems to enchant some gear? I thought about making a combat-focused item, something with weakness to poison built into it so I wouldn't need to spend magicka to kill poison-resistant enemies, but then I remembered how iffy casting alteration spells is, and if I could pair certain alteration spells together, I could get some wild results. Let me explain. I'm enchanting an exquisite robe. Not only did I take her rings, but I also took Lendrali Varum's clothes. On it will put 100 points of feather and 100 points of jump for one second each. Your movement speed and jump height is affected not only by your fatigue, but by how much stuff you're carrying as a percentage of your carrying capacity. 250 out of 500 and 100 out of 200 have the same effect on your mobility. 20 points of strength may boost your carry weight by 100 points, but eliminating 100 points of weight altogether is better, at least for what we want right now. Needless to say, when I jump, I'm gonna jump. Free as a bird. And safely we land. A shorter slow fall spell might be in order. And perhaps I need some way to stop myself from overshooting my destination. Oh, hi Scribbly. Good boy. I'll experiment with it a bit. Anyway, we're here at Natrulef Tinkth to get the excavation report for Edwina. The explorers here need us to find their anus because that's where they kept their reports. But anus is dead. Shame. Next to Mazuleft. She wants some blueprints. This is the Dwemer ruin filled with strong orcs. You don't have to kill them. You can just run in, grab the blueprints, and run out. But why not try killing one of the orcs, right? He's really fast. I did make a low magnitude levitate spell that I could cast on enemies so it slows them down a bit, mostly for enemies that close the gap too quickly. Well, that barely did anything. I will say, the pre-made spell I bought from Esther Dalen is pretty good. People talk about how crazy you can get with a spellmaker, but the default stuff is still pretty viable. It could be a fun way to play a mage to keep yourself from becoming too powerful. Default spells only. Hmm. Now Edwina wants more plans from Bethamez. Last time I came here, I joined the Legion to get in. Turns out you could just pick up this pickaxe and talk to the guard. He assumes you're a miner, so he lets you in. Pickaxes are like orange reflective vests. Wear one and no one will question what you're doing. Airship plans. And that's the last of what Edwina has for us. In fact, we're ready to become Archmage right now, if we had the right levels. We've done enough duties to meet the reputation requirements. But instead of sitting here spamming destruction spells over and over again to get the right levels, let's say we get started on the main quest and level up that way. No package. What? Oh my god, I sold it to Arrow by accident, didn't I? Oh, I just dumped a bunch of- I stole a bunch of stuff from the Census and Excise office, and just sold it all to him. Please still have it. Please- Oh, thank god. Man, that would've sucked. Okay, Caius, I got your package. Has Fat Antibolus? Drummer Puzzle Box? You got it. I've done this song and dance before. It'll be interesting to do the main quest with this absurd jump spell in my back pocket. Snowy Granny has given you trouble? Just get several thousand gold and enchant yourself some robes and jump right over them. Ten points. Ain't Morrowind without a couple cliff racers. Oh, they're actually kind of dangerous against this build. Noted. How much health does this guy have? He can't be higher than, like, level 5. Oh, right. Red Guards resist 75% of poison damage. Wow. Marwind really doesn't like poison magic. Credo was a lot easier to kill. Imperials don't resist poison. And we take the puzzle box. Next, we gotta get the skull from the Andrano Ancestral Tomb for Sharn and the Mages Guild. This will be a bit more of a challenge since the undead are immune to poison completely. At least the skeletons and ghosts are. Bone Lords and Bone Walkers are just very resistant to poison. Not completely immune. The Dire Weakness to Poison spell applies a 2-60% to 60 weakness to poison debuff on the target, and it's enough to make the undead damageable with poison, but at a significantly reduced amount. You saw how weak my spells were against the Redguard and Arkingthand. That's effectively the same as an undead enemy with a 25% weakness applied, so it's better to use a spell that eliminates the resistance altogether. My Immunity Crusher spell is a slow burn, but it guarantees full damage. Casting Dire Weakness and then using Poisonous Touch isn't terrible, 
but I have no way of knowing how strong the weakness effect is, and with how nasty the arrows are, the longer an archer skeleton is left alive, the worse it is for me. Great, the Atronach birth sign absorbed the enchantment on his arrow. I am saved. Alas, poor Levul. I knew him. An elf of infinite jest. Yeah, well who's laughing now? Here's the skull you wanted, Sharn. Do totally not necromancy with it. Caius wants us to get some info from people in Vivek, but before we leave Belmora, let's loot some jewelry from a dead guy. He ain't using it. Roland Hlalo, in the Hlalo Manor, usually has some decent stuff with decent enchanting capacity. Extravagant amulet, extravagant ring, gloves. Quite ostentatious for a dead man. We'll buy a few pieces of exquisite clothing from Millie Hastian near Hlalo Manor as well. Could be useful, and we're gonna need some of it later anyway for the main quest. But Lee is up first, we gotta escort him to Jabasha's bookshop. We could bribe the Dark Elves to leave us alone, but that's no fun. It will die. The one time Hulia doesn't go all crocodile death roll on them is the one time when my build is the paperest of tigers. See, the key is to navigate all the tables and chairs without getting stuck between them, like in a real bar fight. Don't forget to get a copy of The Progress of Truth before leaving Jabasha's. For it here and there, I've grown accustomed to killing the tax man for her rather than lying to him. It's faster, and lying is wrong. I'm acting in self-defense. By right of combat, I'm taking his shirt. All's clear in here and here. And finally, Mara Milo. She's divulging heretical secrets, so she has to be careful not to say these things within earshot of the Ordinators. I finally decided what I want to do with the whole soul vault thing. I'll enchant the shirt that I took from the tax man with one point of levitate for one second and one point of slow fall for five seconds. This will not only prevent me from dying from a high fall, but it'll also kill my momentum mid-air, effectively letting me modulate my jump distance. No more overshooting. In real life, you'd probably launch your eyeballs out of your skull. But hey, this ain't real life. The next part of the main quest is to meet with Hasaur Zain Subani and give him the book I bought from Aldrin's bookseller, who, for the first time, happens to have scrolls of Akash's lock splitter, but one time I have a character that can just cast a 100 point open spell. Zain Subani tells us about the Urshalaku Ashlanders, and now Caius wants us to go meet with the Urshalaku Ashlanders. Normally this is the longest trip, but with my robes of ludicrous jumping, Sul Matul wants us to get the Bone Biter Bow from the Urshalaku Burial Grounds, but before we bound off for the Burial Grounds, let's bounce back to Nissus and buy a better Poison spell. 100% weakness to poison for one second, and 10-30 to 30 points of poison damage on touch. My Immunity Crusher spell, although technically stronger, is too slow. The skeleton's gotta die quick. Two casts of the new spell seems to do the trick. I guess a low roll could be a problem, unless they have less than 20 health, but I doubt that. What makes poison tricky isn't just that I need to pair it with a weakness effect to fight undead, it's that it's just such an expensive damage type that I can't really afford to make on-target spells, so I have to get into melee distance. On-target spells cost 50% more magicka to cast than on-touch spells, so for an on-target spell to cost the same amount of magicka and have the same cast chance as an on-touch spell, it would have to be much weaker than the on-touch spell. On-target poison spells are super expensive rather than just kind of expensive. A poison spell costs 1.8 times as much magicka as a fire spell of the same strength. So an on-target poison spell costs 2.7 times more than the equivalent on-touch fire spell. Poison sucks. What's the point of having scales if they don't deflect arrows? Oh, it's not like scaled armor? Dorian mode? Argonian skin sings? Why? Oh, hissed. Right, right. Somehow, the ghost at the end of the dungeon is easier to kill than the skeletons leading up to it. Not that I'm complaining or anything. It just has a lot more health. But it attacks really slow, so it didn't even hit me. We are now a clan friend of the Urshalaku. And when we report back to Caius, he tells us there's some dastardly goings on near Narmok in the caverns of Ilunibi. Well, actually, he sends us to Fort Buckmoth, and someone there tells us to go to Ilanibi, but whatever. We gotta kill Dagoth Gowries. Fortunately, even though the Ash Slaves, Ash Zombies, and Noodle Snoots are sorta undead, poison still works on them just fine. Works on Corporate Stalkers, too. But that makes sense, since they're not technically dead, they're just cursed. Or blessed. 
depending on who you ask. Dagothar, blessed. Literally anyone else, cursed. Oh no, the Ash Slaves have a reflect effect. Please spare me. Let's see how we fare against Noodle Snoots. Their magic dot, damage over time if you're not aware, I figure, I mean I assume most people know what that means, but if you don't, now you do. So their magic dot is pretty weak, and their claws don't do that much damage. Surprisingly. And the poison works decently well. I believe you could place multiple similar debuffs on an enemy, assuming they all come from different spells. So if I made multiple 1 to 5 damage for 10 second spells, I could stack them. But what seems to work well is placing the dot on the enemy, then just using my 1 second spells. That way there's always some damage ticking on them while I ready up another spell. Let's not forget to grab the Fist of Randagulf. I have no restrictions on using miscellaneous skills, so I'm gonna wear these. The extra strength and agility might not improve my magic, but it's not like I'm wearing anything else right now. And the extra carry weight's nice. Scales. So Caius says we can't come back to his skooma den until we get our corpus checked out. He may be a slave to the sugar, but he's only made it this far by being responsible with who he shares his space with. I respect that. But since corpus reduces our personality a bit, I think this is the perfect time to take a sip from the bitter cup. Our recall point is still back at the Urshalaku camp, so getting there will be really quick. A single leap across the water. Such a simple task for a member of the Bal Mulligmur. We'll just sneak by them instead. Grab the key, loot the chest underwater for some good loot, including an acrobatic skill book, and get ready to fight against a skeleton and a stronger skeleton. I don't know who's scarier. The one with a ton of health and a vampiric ring that drains me of life and energy, or the one with a bone arrow. One wields powers, most arcane and terrible. The other can poke me, like really hard and from really far away. The archer was the scarier one. I feel way safer now that it's dead. Alright, with both skellies dead, we can safely drink from the bitter cup. I found some flint earlier, and it'll boost our willpower to 94, so when we drink from the cup, we'll get a permanent 20 point increase to willpower. And since our personality's been drained to 29, it'll get reduced by 20 points. Everyone already hates us anyway, and Tavani Bugma solves all sorts of problems. No one can resist the aroma. Why willpower instead of intelligence? Well, getting intelligence attributes is way easier than willpower points, and the extra willpower will improve my cast chance just by a little bit. Either would have been a good choice though. Now we can go to Devaith Fear and get cured. Well, he doesn't much care for us right now. We're gonna have to drop a lot of gold bribing him before he'll ask us to do him the favor of getting his own boots from Jaeger and Bagon. Who'd have guessed that Telvanni hated Argonians? Although, admittedly, they hate everyone. So this guy right here is one of Devaith Fear's patients, and by the looks of him, I really doubt anything Devaith could do would work. It worked. Oh, of course, once we get cleaned up, Caius is bouncing and taking a bunch of his skooma with him. Bogotted the whole damn pipe. Fine, I'll see if Maramilo can hook me up. You know, if I'm the leader of the Blades now, I should probably just go find that guy. What's his name? Fast Eddie. I bet he knows all the guys. How difficult do you think magic is in Tamriel? Is it something you need an innate talent for? You have to be born with some sort of mysticalness? Or can anyone learn it if they buy a simple enough spell and practice? Are enchanted items easily available? And if it is easy to learn, why does anyone bother locking their doors? A simple spell is all it takes to open them. And shouldn't everyone just learn an intervention spell? Damn it, I forgot the divine intervention spell. Ugh. Merit, you're a priestess. Learn some magic. Oh, please. By all means, ask me lots of questions. Okay, Mara. I'll meet you at Holomayan. I'm gonna say it again. This ain't a portal. I know portal can technically refer to any and all doors, but if you go to someone's house and they tell you to use the front portal and not the side portal to come in, you're about to walk into the home of a serial killer. Portals are magical doorways. Or frustrating web applications that's different for every doctor's office because our lives are just a series of logins and passwords. We're just numbers in a system. We take the books Gilvis Borello unloaded on us back to the Urshalaku camp and Tool sends us off to Kogarin to collect some random crap. First squid face of the run. Being an Argonian actually makes fighting them a bit tougher. They usually cast a poison spell, but since I'm immune to poison, it's instead using a frost attack. Since frost costs less magicka than poison, it takes a lot longer for its magicka to run out. We did level up against this guy though. Level 6. Another noodle snoot. Still pretty easy, just time consuming. Weepings, Dagoth cup, and now down to the bowels of Kogarin to get the shadow shield. You know what, I'm just gonna run past the Fire Atronax. They die in about 3 hits, but trying to deplete their magicka in tight quarters is too risky. Yeah, I could just try to kill them without depleting their magicka, but if I get hit once, 
I die. Unless I luck out and I happen to absorb all of their attacks with my Atronac birth sign. There's something ironic about the Atronac birth sign absorbing Atronac attacks. Regardless, it's easier just to run by them and pretend they don't exist. I did luck out and absorb the damage strength spell that the Bonewalker cast on me. It's kind of a shame though because I actually brought a restore strength potion with me this time around. Time to fight our first Ash Vampire. We'll throw a dot on him and spam Poisonous Touch. Gotta stay out of melee range though. Seems the Dark Souls strafing strat still works even if you're using touch spells. Don't know why it wouldn't, but it does work. It's just a little more risky, very feast or famine. Definitely easier to do in Dark Souls though because you don't have to keep turning your camera to keep the enemy in front of you, since you can lock on. You can't lock on a Morrowind. I sometimes like saying things that are obvious. So in this part of the dungeon we have a Noodle Snoot and two Flame Atronax, at least. So I'm just gonna zerg my way to the Shadow Shield and teleport out before they kill me. Oh, also the Daedric Gauntlets, don't want to forget about them. Third trial completed, we can ditch all this junk. While doing a bit of wheeling and dealing, I got 60 destruction. Time to rank up in the Mages Guild. Warlock and Wizard if we either buy a Wizard Staff or retrieve one from a former Mages Guild member, Anirn. The last time I did this quest, a lot of people thought the chat box said, ask about anime. So rather than getting into a long conversation about obscure slice of life anime that I personally can never understand the appeal of, we'll just buy the staff for 5k. Now you may be wondering how I was able to reach the rank of wizard with only 60 destruction. This confused me as well, but at the time I just assumed it was some weird quirk of the rank. Since there's something special about it, maybe it doesn't have a hard level requirement of 70. It does. You see, alchemy is a mage's guild skill, and somehow it didn't register with me until halfway through making this video. Not halfway through the run, halfway through scripting and editing. I could have very easily gone and challenged the archmage and gotten his loot at this very moment. My alchemy level was around level 75 at this point. Getting to 80 would have taken a few minutes. Thankfully, I will speak to the archmage before grinding out 80 destruction, but that'll happen later. Partially because I wanted to test something out with the arena. You'll see what I mean when we get closer to that part of the video. I promise there will be a day where I produce one of these videos without making a single glaring error. For now, you'll have to be content with several glaring errors. That Elden Ring video was a comedy of errors. As usual, before going to the Cavern of the Incarnate, we stop by the Nerano Ancestral Tomb to kill Calvario, the vampire. Undead, but not resistant to poison. Vampires are immune to disease and paralysis, not poison. Disease makes sense since blood is full of communicable diseases. Not being immune to poison though, that's strange. I'm pretty sure Skyrim's vampires are immune to poison. That makes sense. Although then when you think about it, if you're immune to poison, you should also be immune to potions and medications and drugs and things like that. That could be one of the drawbacks of being a vampire. Could make for some interesting roleplay. You can't drink potions as a vampire because you don't have a heartbeat, so anything you consume can't go into your blood and circulate around. But then why do they have to drink blood? Who knows? Funny enough, the skeletons gave me more trouble than Calvario did. I think it's in part because Calvario doesn't use melee, so he has a longer wind-up for his spells. And Cal is dead. Kaushad will be happy to hear it. Always remember to return to the Urshalaku camp and officially be recognized as the Nerevarine. And with that, we can get started on my least favorite part of the game, becoming Hortator and Nerevarine. We'll speed through the non-combat parts, starting with the Ahamusa tribe. Aren't escort quests fun? Avoid the enemies, no need to get involved. Oh, well, I was happy to help. Oh, son of a- Yeah, great, new home, good luck, bye. Peace through strength, strength through chaos. A Rebanimsum up next. We gotta kill the current leaders of the clan and pilfer their murdered corpses to give the peace-loving Hanamu the confidence to lead his people. A necklace of elf ears would be going too far. These fights were actually kind of tough, not because the enemies had a lot of health or resistances, but because these yurts are very claustrophobic, at least for combat. They look very cozy to live in, but I won't want to fight in them. Although admittedly, I wouldn't want to fight in a gymnasium either. In real life, it's the fighting part that I'm less interested in than it is the real estate. Ashu Ahi was probably the easiest to kill since it was just the two of us fighting. He couldn't make it if he tried. Renabi summoned a skeleton, so that made maneuvering a bit awkward. Ahaz and Ulith Pal are in the same yurt, so it's not hard to get one shot by them. Renabi did drop a pair of gloves though, one of which will be useful. 1 to 30% weakness to poison for 10 seconds. A weakness effect that costs no magicka? Don't mind if I do. It means I'll have to unequip my agility buffing Fist of Randagulf to cast the spell, but agility's not that important for me anyway. Yeah, I could re-equip the fist after casting the spell, but that's a pain in the ass, and I don't mind having asymmetrical hands. Here you go, Hanamu. Dead men's clothes. Shall I bring you their children's teeth as well? 
Oh, you're good? All right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the nerve-ring thing. So, see you around. Casting Divine Intervention from the camp takes us back to Sadrath Mora, so it's time to deal with the Zainab Ashwinders. But you know what would be fun? I still have those scrolls of Akarian Flight. What if we paired 1,000 points of acrobatics with 100 points of jump and 100 points of feather? You think that'll overshoot the Zainab camp? Oh wow, yeah, definitely gonna overshoot it. Damn, you really can do anything in this game. And intestines explode from hyenas. So escorting Falora, Kaushad's Telvani bride, to the Zainab camp isn't as terrible as escorting Sanamu to Aldeidroth, but it's still very annoying because escort quests suck. There's a lot of wildlife that attacks you on the way, and Falora can't help but fight them because she's a companion. It's respectable, but I don't want her fighting. It just slows me down. To get around this, we'll tell her to wait and then cast Frenzy on her. This way she gets pissed at us and tunnels. I'm the only thing she wants to attack, so evading Grey's Land enemies should be way easier. And once we get close enough to the camp, cast command, cast command, cast command, cast command. We cast the damn spell. Cast command humanoid and bring her to Kaushad. Zainab Naravarine. Yeah, I have no fatigue. I know, I know. The fatigue effects spell cast. Yeah, 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 shut up. Tavani Hortator is easy, but we need some Tavani bug mouse because there ain't no way I'll convince any of them to vote for me with 10 personality. I'll buy Sien Sintiev's entire stock. And while we're here in Aldrun, let's get started with the Red Around Hortator stuff. Save Sarethi's son, talk to the other counselors to secure their vote, challenge Boulevard Venom to a duel, we'll meet him in the Vivek Arena soon enough. For three of the Telvani counselors, we just drink the Bug Musk, or use it as perfume, I don't know exactly what it is, no one does, and give them gold until their disposition is above 80. That works for Nelith, Dratha, and Therana. I actually think Nelith just has to be above 70, but it doesn't matter. But unlike the other three, Arch Magister Gothrin, he's gotta die just as the Telvani intended. Surprisingly, his Dramora are the least of my problems because his initial fireball hits everything in his tiny little room. As long as the Atronach sign absorbs it, I take no damage, and the Dramora get brought down to about half health. The bigger issue is the people downstairs joining the fight. I've got enough to deal with already, so instead of attacking him outright, I'll cast Frenzy, making him the aggressor, and keeping his allies from jumping to his defense. Like most fights, the biggest obstacle to success is literal obstacles. Enclosed spaces are brutal to fight even a single enemy in, let alone three. It's what made Blood Moon at level 1 so tough. The Crypts in Solstheim are cramped and bloated with Draugr. And that's the Telvanni Hortator. Blavlu time. Like Telvanni, it's mostly running to each counselor, paying some of them, and killing another. Crassius and Ingling take their fee. Drambaro lost his little game of hide and seek, and that means we're qualified to lead the Halalu's forces as Hortator. And Orvis Dren, he's gotta die. He's a tough one though, for the same reasons as every other fight, but with an added twist. Tight quarters are a nuisance, but he's got a spear, so the window of time I have to attack him and run out of his range is much, much narrower. That said, since he attacked me when I mentioned defeating Dagoth Ur, his bodyguards don't jump in to help. I could have bribed him to avoid combat, but where's the fun in that? With Orvis Dren dead, the other two counselors look inward, introspect a bit, and realize they wanted to vote for me the entire time. All that's left for the Redoran Hortator is to fight Bovar Venom, but I'm curious what'll happen if I also challenge the Archmage to a duel. Will both Artorius and Venom be in the arena at the same time? I was all ready to embark on the journey of grinding to 80 destruction from 66, or at least to 75, and then collect some skill books, but then I spoke with Artorius and just happened to click Advancement, and he ranked me up to Master Wizard. That surprised me. The only requirement to challenge the Archmage is being at the rank of Master Wizard. So I challenged him. At the time, I didn't know why this was working, but it was working. I figured it was some quirk I wasn't understanding, but it was because I'd leveled my alchemy past 80. This game's hard. Unfortunately, when I returned to the arena, only Bolvar was down in the pit. So what about Artorius? Do I have to challenge him again so he shows up? Nope, just gotta walk out and walk back in. And now he's here. He's probably concerned because I just killed the last guy I fought. His amulet has a 25% chance to absorb spells, so it took quite a while for me to do him in with my nasty venom. And he seemed to have some anti-venoms on hand, but like the wily snake, Gila is a patient killer. If prey makes me wait, then I shall wait. Resist normal weapons 25%, fortify intelligence by 25 points, restore 1 point of health per second, and an additional 25 points of spell absorption. Spell absorption doesn't stack additively with the Atronach sign, so my overall spell absorption is around 63%, not 75%. Still good though. The last thing for us to do is to speak with Sarethi, officially become Redoran Hortator, and then meet with Vivek to discuss the plan to topple Dagothar. He gives us Wraithguard and sends us off to Red Mountain. 
In Ojasaw, we open the lock door magically and steal Keening from the shrine. And then we kill Dagoth Odros. Dunk on him for not securing Keening better. An easy kill. I wonder if Dagoth Era set up the shrine with Keening and just told Odros to guard it just to keep him busy. Odros is definitely the dumbest of the bunch. Veminel is a bit tougher. A lot more enemies in here, and Dagoth Vemin is actually holding on to Sunder and didn't just lock it behind a door. Is there a lore reason why Sunder is more heavily guarded? Hell, why doesn't Dagoth Ur just keep them in the heart chamber with him? Vemin's a bit tougher than Odros, but I'm gonna chalk part of that up to the room. Odros's chamber has pillars, but Vemin's got this dais that complicates things. His spells are easy to dodge, though. With Sunder and Keening in hand, we're ready to take on Dagoth Ur, but we're actually gonna drop both weapons off in Balmora. Like I said at the start, I can only do poison damage. The heart does have a health pool, so using Sunder and Keening on it would mean doing non-poison damage. I can't use Sunder and Keening. Does this mean I could have skipped the whole main quest and just went straight to getting Sunder and Keening without bothering with Wraithguard? Yeah. Why didn't I do that? Well, when I started this run, I kind of had the idea that I was going to make an exception for Sunder and Keening, but then I changed my mind. But I'm writing the video as if I thought of it immediately. So, um, whatever. First thing we gotta do is defeat Dagoth Ur's first form. I killed some of the enemies in Dagoth Ur, the dungeon, on the way just to make the next part of this a bit easier. The Squid Faces, the Bone Walkers, the Bone Lord, and the final Ash Vampire. Clear out the trash mobs before you fight the boss. Dagoth Ur himself isn't that tough. I managed to absorb two of his spells and dodge the third one. And then it turned into the usual Ash Vampire dance. His claws versus my claws, but mine come with poison. Now we need to deal with his second form. What a fool you are. If we approach the heart, Dagoth Ur reappears on the bridge. And if we levitate over the lava, we can confuse his pathing and force him to plummet into the lava. My shirt has only one second of levitate, but I can spam it to stay aloft. Excellent. Uh-oh. Oh, almost fell in the lava with him. That would have been awkward for both of us. Now it's time to escort Amelia up Red Mountain. If you watched my take on the pacifist Morrowind run, then you know what's coming. If not, you could watch that video for more details. What I can say that's different from that video is that it's way easier to lead an angry Amelia up the mountain when I'm able to attack all the cliff racers that start chasing me. She still has trouble on the bridge for some reason, no! but that's the worst of it. I'm getting out of here. Leading her to the heart chamber is just like leading her to the mud crab merchant. Frenzy, run to the door into the next cell, command, enter the new cell, frenzy again, and repeat. Oh, I enchanted some jewelry with the Command Humanoid and Command Creature effects, so I wouldn't have to worry about Magicka. With the two of us now at the heart, I can cast Command Creature on the heart, and Command Humanoid on Amelia, and use her travel service to teleport all of us to Balmora. And now I'm realizing the Mudcrab Merchant is sort of blocking the door, so bringing NPCs in here might be a bit tough. Instead, we'll bring the three of us to Caldera. We're gonna want to return Amelia to Caldera anyway. There are a few merchants in Caldera, and they should suffice as Nerevarine proxies. Oh, uh, the heart followed me out of the building. Huh, I guess that simplifies things. We sell Sunder to Urgola, command him out of his shop, then get him to attack the heart by taunting him, then commanding the heart. That's one strike with Sunder, plus a few more. He'll be busy for a bit. I'll skip this next part. Neither Varric Germain or Hodless Mud the Smith will wield Keening if they enter combat with it in their inventory. So instead, I went back to Balmora and got Meldor the Wood Elf. Rather than taunting him, if I command the heart first to then frenzy Meldor, he'll attack the heart immediately. The hell happened? Did Argola hit him in the crossfire? Fantastic. And since we're already in combat, I can kill these two and get the weapons back without suffering any consequences. This is self-defense. When we return to Akulakan, It looks like a simple crumbling of stone and metal, but I like to think there's something a bit more metaphysical happening here. Well, there you have it. Beating Morrowind with the worst damage type only. Hela the Nerevarine, first of her name. Long may she bask in Vardenfell's newly clear skies. Hopefully there'll be no more ash storms. 
Defeating Dagothar probably made the volcano go dormant. It's probably going to be thousands of years before this thing erupts. Right? 